Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good uh, uh, morning, everyone, depending on where you are uh, uh, joining us from. Uh, so my name is uh, Darwin's Chimba. I'm a, a final year medical student from Copper Belt University School of Medicine, Zambia. And I'm the director of operations for the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. So today we are very happy and privileged to have uh, a presentation uh, from our colleague, uh, on uh, diagnosis and management of uh, sup uh, supratentorial uh, tumors. So it's going to be an, inter uh, an interesting one, and I really hope that we are all going to follow. But before we uh, get into the presentation, I'm going to ask uh, everyone to introduce themselves, and I'll be calling out names as they appear on my screen so that people can introduce themselves, and then uh, the, the presenter is going to introduce himself and then going to stretch uh, the presentation. So um, uh, we have Dr. Afnan. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Yes, you are pronounced it correctly. Uh, my name is Dr. Afnan Hassab. Uh, I am an intern. I am from Sudan. And I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Afnan, for being here with us. We are very glad to have you and uh, please, uh, be here with us uh, uh, next time. Then now uh, we yes, have Dr. Dr. Anthony. Dr. Anthony, please, you can introduce yourself. Um, hello, um, darling. Hello, everyone. My name is Shubikam uh, Anthony Kubwing, a medical doctor from Lagos, Nigeria, um, and research fellow with AFAN. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chubikam, for being here with us. Then uh, we have Dr. Ben. Please, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, I'm Dr. Ben Maina. I'm a neurosurgical trainee from Kenya. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ben. Uh, then we have um, uh, Chijebe. Uh, please, you can introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Chijebe Ibe, and um, I'm the creative director of AFAN, and it's good to be here today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jebe. We are really happy. So whenever you see all those posters uh, uh, for the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons, uh, all the credit really goes to Jebe. Is, is, is our creative uh, director and is uh, really good at that. Then we have uh, uh, Dr. Eddie Dion. Please, you can introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Edith Young, Ekme Young. I'm an aspiring neurosurgeon. I was invited here by Chidebere Ibe. Thank you so much, uh, Edith Young. We are really happy to have you here. Then now uh, we have uh, Dr. Gilbert, uh, Corey. Dr. Gilbert, can, uh, can you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Dr. Kirol Paul, uh, a neurosurgical trainee here at Makere University. I'm very happy and pleased to be uh, around. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul, for being here. Then now uh, we have uh, uh, Olalua Ezekiel. Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Olalua Ezekiel. I'm a second year medical student from the University of Ibadan and a research fellow at the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ezekiel. Always happy to have you. Then we have um, Alice. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mutoni Alice uh, from Rwanda, from the University of Rwanda, a uh, fourth year medical student at the research fellow in AFAM. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice, for being here. All right, so I'm going to ask the presenter to introduce himself and go straight into the presentation. But before that, um, as we uh, announced earlier, we're supposed to have two presentations. But uh, due to circumstances beyond control by the first, the one was supposed to be the first presenter. Uh, we don't have her here with us. So I'm just going to have one presentation uh, for this evening. So I'm going to call on the presenter to please go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darwin. Um, good evening, everybody. I am Soba Ogunfolaji. I am just a recently inducted medical doctor from the University of Ibadan. Okay, so um, as a form of introduction, 
the CNS, that is the central nervous system, is enveloped by meningeal layers, the lower matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Now, these um, meningeal layers enfold on themselves and into the brain matter. And as such, they divide the major aspects of the um, brain into parts or into compartments. The Falk cerebri, which is an infolding of the meningeal layers, divide the cerebral hemispheres into to the left and the right hemispheres. While um, the tentorium or the Falk cerebri divide the cerebral hemispheres into or the uh, brain matter into two compartments. The first compartment is the compartment above the tentorium, and that compartment is known as the supratentorial compartment, while the other compartment is the one below the tentorium, which is um, known as the infratentorial compartment. Now, this is an image showing um, what I just said. So um, although it's not it's a 2D image, it's not showing all the, the meningeal layers. However, um, if you can just follow my cursor, the, the um, meninges usually enfold into this uh, crevice here, if I can use that word here, and divide this upper part into the supratentorial compartment and the lower part into the infratentorial compartment. Now, um, in, the, in this compartment, we have different organs, uh, different um, components. In the supratentorial compartment, there's, there are the hemispheres, then you have the basal ganglia, the thalamic nuclei, the lateral ventricles, the hypothalamus, and the corpus callosum. In the infratentorial compartment, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the fourth ventricles are the major components of this compartment. Now, going um, into the incidence of supratentorial tumors, it's the second most common form of cancers in children, that's after the blood cancers, and it contributes about 5% of deaths in the pediatric population. However, when you are now looking at the division of tumors, CNS tumors in this population, um, different studies have shown that there's about a 40% supratentorial distribution of tumors and a 60% distribution of infratentorial tumors in, um, in this um, population. In the adult population, it's the sixth commonest cause of cancers, of cancer deaths in them. And about 25% of tumors in adults are in the CNS. But when now look at the division, the distribution of these tumors, about 85% are in the supratentorial compartment, while 15 to 20% are in the infratentorial compartment. Uh, factors leading to most CNS tumors are quite uh, unknown. Uh, most of the factors known are just sometimes um, um, speculations. For most primary tumors of the CNS, it's sporadic and have unknown etiologies. While for secondary tumors, those are metastases, uh, they contribute about 40%, 14 to 40% of um, tumor body. Less than 5% are due to some syndromes, genetic and hereditary syndromes. While ionizing radiation have been the, um, has been the um, major factor that has been implicated in most of these tumors. Um, in children, there's a 2.3% incidence of brain tumors, especially in those who were um, irradiated, who were exposed to renal irradiation for acute leukemia. So in most of these people, you would always find that they have a higher chance of primary brain tumors in them. Also, the meningiomas and some lymphomas, CNS lymphomas, also um, are um, thought to be caused by being exposed to ionizing radiation. Some of the uh, hereditary syndromes that may cause or that may increase the, the risk of getting CNS tumors are shown in this table. So the neurofibromatosis syndromes, Tourette, Ronita, Lindor, Life for many and Golin syndrome are syndromes that have been studied and that have been shown to have some um, impact or some import in CNS tumor regenesis. And some of the tumors shown are there with the affected genes. Now, going um, into the matter of discussion today, supratentorial tumors can be divided into infraparenchymal or extraixia. And in infraparenchymal tumors, the major um, feature of these tumors is that they are within the brain matter or the brain tissue, while the extraaxial tumors are outside the brain matter, but you may find them in the 
um, arising from the skull or the meninges, or sometimes the overlying um, tissue of the skull. So uh, commonly in the infraparenchymal tumors, the more commonly um, seen ones are the astrocytomas, the ependymomas, the desmoplastic neuroepithelial tumor, the dis disembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumors, gangliomas, teratomas, primitive neuroectodermal tumors, and rhabdoid tumors. Extraexial tumors are the choroid plexus, papillomas, or carcinoma. The longer hand cell is to cytosis, epidermoid or dermoid cyst, and the arachnoid cyst. As mentioned earlier, metastasis to form about 14 to 40% of some of these tumors. And um, half of those tumors, half of those metastases are usually long from the lung um, tissue, lung carcinoma. However, uh, melanomas, breast cancer, uh, renal cell carcinoma, colorectal cancer, and nasopharyngeal carcinoma also have some contribution to metastasis to the brain. Now, in um, understanding the signs and symptoms of these tumors, we need to understand uh, the concept of the um, Kelly-Murrow um, hypothesis. Now, the skull, as it is, is a closed compartment. So, being closed, it means that the components or the uh, the components inside the skull are also within a closed or a fixed volume or pressure. So, once there is one, once any of those compartments become larger or more than the other, then you'd start having symptoms of what we call increased infracranial pressures, which is which are the core, which is the underlying um, um, pathology, more or less, the underlying pathology in the in the symptomatology of these tumors. Now, um, these components are usually the brain matter, the CSF and blood. So once there's a tumor and that tumor is not within the confines of its tissue, because you expect that with tumors, they have, you would have masses and lesions, and these lesions will grow out of proportion. Then you start having symptoms of raised intracranial pressures. And some of these symptoms are here listed. Um, headaches, nausea and vomiting, double vision, head tilt, decreased alertness, lethargy or irritability, especially in the pediatric population, poor feeding, endocrine dysfunction, and unexplained behavioral changes. Again, some of these symptoms may also be explained by the location of the tumor, whichever tumor you are looking at at the time. The signs that are evident when there is uh, waste ICP due to a tumor or due to any other thing majorly are papilledema, loss of vision, uh, bulging fontanelles, certain sun sign, um, increased blood pressure or low pulse, and herniation. Uh, well, if, if the, if the skull is a fixed compartment, then it just goes to show that once there's an increase in pressure within the skull, then it also means that the contents or components inside the skull would look for the nearest um, outlet. And most of these outlets are, if we say, in the base of the skull leading to herniation. Now, anatomic location also have, um, locations have clinical considerations when it comes to signs and symptoms. So being in supratentorial, it also means that most of these lesions, most of these tumors will be found in um, the major lobes of the hemisphere, cerebral hemispheres, the frontal lobe, the retal lobe, the temporal lobe, or the occipital lobe. They can also be found in the thalamic nuclei, the basal ganglia. Now, with um, the tumors in each of these, in each of these lobes, they would come up, they would present with certain symptoms that would help us to better localize where the tumors are. Now, some of these symptoms, most of these symptoms will deal with personality changes, especially those of the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the temporal lobe. Um, in the frontal lobe syndrome, you would have, uh, it could, in, in each of these syndromes, since most of these um, lobes are bilateral, you could either have a unilateral syndrome or a bilateral lobe syndrome. Now, in each of these, Common presentations would be um, personality changes, as I've mentioned, um, changes in execution, changes in attention, changes in thinking and cognition. In the central lobe, there will be auditory and olfactory, thalamic nuclei, and also in the in the thalamic nuclei, disorders, some movement disorders and movement in coordination. Um, diagnosis for diagnosing tumors, any kind of CNS tumor, um, imaging is the gold standard. And among the imaging modalities, 
magnetic resonance imaging is the most specific. Now, why it's more specific than most other imaging modalities is that it helps with um, it helps to delineate soft tissue better than most other modalities. Then with the magnetic resonance imaging, you can easily find soft tissue changes over time. Again, you can also be able to pick out changes in the surrounding tissue and in the tumor at the time you are making the image or doing the imaging. So it's the most specific and most sought um, imaging modality for diagnosis of um, tumors. Um, the MRI images are, are often presented in pulse sequences, the more popular one being the T1 and T2 weighted images. But the others are the flare, the stare, the MRI, TOF images, and the direction weighted images. Um, yeah, other imaging modalities can also be used, especially in cases where there is limited access to magnetic resonance imaging um, facilities, or in patients that have metallic implants. Yes, in patients that have metallic implants, usually magnetic resonance imaging. Um, uh, yes, imaging is often not um, indicated in, in this patient. So you could do a computed tomography scan, a positron emission tomography scan, or a plain X-ray. Now, um, with the plain with the plain X-ray, it's a little bit archaic and out of date. And why it's so is because it's majorly indicated in cases of bone pathology. And um, the only times you may use this is if these other modalities are not available, as it occurs in some places within the continent, or if you suspect that some of these tumors are arising from the skull or impinging on the skull and causing some bony changes. Um, other diagnostic investigations would include a tissue biopsy with immunochemical staining and CSF analysis. With um, tissue biopsy, usually the tissue biopsy could be open biopsy or stereotactic biopsy. With the open biopsy, you do a craniotomy and you, especially when, um, after doing imaging, you find out that the tumor is in, is in a position, a location that is easily accessible when you open up the skull via a craniotomy or craniectomy. So you can do an open biopsy. In the stereotactic biopsy, these are more indicated in, um, cases where the tumor is in a location that may not be easily accessible when you do an open biopsy. You know, chemical stains would allow you to know the kinds of tissues, the kind of cells that are available or that are present within the tumor, or to help you better typify the tumor and to class the tumor that it is. Then that would also help with the kinds of management you would institute for this for this patient, or in this case, CSF analysis is, um, best indicated in tumors that can easily spread by CSF, some gliomas, medulloblastomas. Other ancillary tests are often done for patients to walk up, especially before surgery, CGs and chest x-rays for patients who are older. And some of these tests are also based on um, standard local operating protocols. So we'll be moving on to the images now. And due to the sheer size of, of uh, the sheer number of supratentorial tumors, as have been listed, um, we'll just be taking a selected number of uh, tumors, supratentorial tumors, to look at their features and also to see the changes that often occur in them to be able to help us make diagnosis. Um, most of the images will be MRI images, which is a gold standard. Uh, then there will be histologic images as we go ahead. There may be a few CT images though. Uh, with the diffuse astrocytoma. Now, these are more commonly seen, both in the adult and pediatric population. With diffuse astrocytomas on the exile T1, you notice that there is an, um, there's usually a diffuse infiltration of the white matter. Now, this is the white matter. For most, um, most people would know this is the white matter. And here, just in the frontal lobe here, with where the laser pointer is, there is a hypodense, there's a hypointense uh, lesion that is infiltrating into the white matter. And that is actually a diffuse astrocytoma. It's also hypodense to the gray matter. For most MRI images, um, the terms used are hypointense, hypo, hypointense, hyperintense, and isointense. So this is actually hypointense. I was mentioning hypodense. This is actually hypointense. And there is a diffuse infiltration into the white matter. Now, um, in exile T2 and exile flare, 
the tumor is the lesion is hyper intense, hyper intense to the green matter, and also hyper intense to the surrounding tissue, also showing diffuse infiltration into the white matter. In the um, diffusion weighted imaging, now with diffusion weighted imaging, it looks at the diffusion of molecules, usually fluid and water molecules within tissue. So in diffusion weighted imaging, it shows that there's no restriction of diffusion within the tumor, as is shown here. So you can see that it has a high um, signal in the diffusion weighted imaging, the exact diffusion weighted imaging. And to this side, we find the summary of the MRI findings. Uh, on T1 hypo intense to the gray matter, as mentioned, hyper intense to gray matter on T2. On fluid attenuation inversion um, recovery, it's homogeneous. There's a homogeneous signal with hyper intense, hyper intensity to gray matter. On contrast enhancement, usually there's no enhancement. Now, with, with um, also contrast enhancement is a form of um, modality within magnetic resonance imaging. And in this case, gadolinium is really injected into the vessels and to see if there is any optic by the tumor of this contrast. If there's any optic by the tumor, it shows as a hyper-intense signal. But there is no, um, usually in diffuse astrocytomas, there is no uh, enhancement. And this may be explained by the fact that diffuse astrocytomas may often not show um, angiogenesis or vascular proliferation within the, within the tumor. Um, now, this is an histologic image of diffuse astrocytomas. Uh, this is medium power. Uh, Summarily, it shows that there's infiltrative diffuse growth as shown here, and it's moderately cellular with irregular cell distribution and nuclear atypia. Um, nuclear atypia means that the nucleus of most cells, usually the nucleus of most cells have a, a um, nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio and there's a standard nuclear cytoplasmic ratio for most cells, where usually in most of the cells, the cytoplasm is larger and much more than the um, nuclear space. But in nuclear atypia, the nucleus becomes bigger than most um, than the cytoplasm or giving or leaving just a little cytoplasmic space within the cell. There's, there are no areas of necrosis or microvascular proliferation, which again would explain why there is no enhancement on MRI and there's variable calcific changes microcytic changes in diffuse astrocytomas. Glioblastomas are the more or less like the, the highest grade of, of astrocytomas. They are the most malignant um, tumors, astrocytomas, especially in adults, and can become quite big. They can grow to quite considerable size as shown here. In fact, this is almost taking up the whole parietal and temporal lobe if you, if you look at it. Now, because of their sheer size, it's um, on most of the um, weighted images under MRI that you'd see, uh, they would have heterogeneous signaling. Heterogeneous signaling because they are, they, they are quite big and there are areas of necrosis or apoptosis going on within the tumor. So here is the exile T1. And in the exile T1, you can see that um, there is heterogeneous signal and it is hypo-intense to the gray matter. It's hypo intense also to the surrounding tissue. So it's um, this is the, the core finding within exile T1 for glioblastoma. In the exile T2, it's heterogeneous signaling, but more hyper intense. Now, also, there are areas of peritumoral edema, as may be shown here, areas of peritumoral edema too. Um, this is the exile flare, also hyper intense to the green matter. And in the um, T1 contrast enhanced image, you can see that there is a original signal, but again, this um, enhancement is just in the outer uh, border of the tumor. Now, this would be ex the explanation for this is most likely that um, in the peripheral region of the tumor, there is vascular proliferation going on. But um, as the tumor gets bigger in size, the amount of blood vessels within the tumor. Um, there's almost always no blood vessel within the tumor, which may lead to the necrosis and apoptosis going on within the tumor because of its sheer size. So that is why there may be no enhancement within the tumor as shown here. Um, summarily, on C1, in fact, in all the, in all the um, weighted images, there is heterogeneous signal. But on C1, as shown and as said, it's hypointensive to 
to the wind tissue. On T2, it's hyper intense. On flare, it's hyper intense with edema shown and seen. While on contrast enhanced imaging, there's heterogeneous enhancement. While on um, diffusion weighted imaging, there's typically no restriction. Histology of glioblastoma shows that there are highly anaplastic glial cells with nuclear ATP and pleomorphism. Um, pleomorphic cells are cells that have taken up a lot of different shapes, shapes that are not their primary shapes um, or orientation in the normal human tissue. There's microvascular proliferation, vascular thrombosis, necrosis and apoptosis also go on within the, um, within the uh, mesologic sample as seen. And there's variable mitosis and inflammation. Uh, well, with, with necrosis going on, there, definitely there will be some inflammation and um, the tumor becoming bigger and bigger would explain the mitosis going on. Now, um, to the left, where the pointer is, is a CT image of a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. This is another variant of an astrocytoma. And it has both a cystic and a um, solid component. In CT scans, you would have usually the terms used are the hypo, hyper, or isodense. Uh, and usually you use the bone, the bone as a, as a landmark. So the bone is hyperdense. So any tissue that has almost the same um, density as the bone is also said to be hyperdense. Now the solid tissue within this xanthoastrocytoma is hyperdense. And um, just by the side is a hypodense area with well circumscribed or well demarcated border. And that's the cystic component of a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. Also here, um, also, um, I forgot to mention in the glioblastoma, but here you can also see that there is some form of midline shift. Now, midline shift occurs when tissue moves to the other, to the contralateral side of the other hemisphere. As you can see here, there's a midline shift. Usually the, the midline for all um, tissue, cerebral tissue should just follow the midline as shown, but now there is a shift to the other um, side and there is an effacement or obliteration of the last ventricles as shown here. Here is the um, XRT1 with contrast enhanced imaging and it shows homogeneous uptake of the contrast within the solid component. Then the cystic component is um, hypo, hypo intense with areas of peritoneal edema as shown. The Exer T2 and Exer flare images are also showing more or less the same thing, hypo, hyper intensity within the solid components and um, areas of peritoneal edema. Um, usually these tumors are located within the temporal lobe and the solid component on T1 is also too hyper intense. On T2, the solid component is hyper intense with the cystic component being iso intense to CSF. Flare also shows hyper intensity to the um, um, gray matter, while diffusion weighted imaging shows no restriction. On CT, there's hypo or iso density with the tumor looking poorly demarcated, but in our own image, we have a well de demarcated tumor, no surrounding edema or no scalloping of a line bone. Uh, in this case, in this kind of case, if there is no CT and um, MRI, then you may decide to use, or you may want to use an a, Clean x ray to see if there's any scalloping of a line bone, but still it's not as specific as the other imaging. Um, on histology, you find that the tumor is, has a rich reticulin network, as shown here, all the reticulin network is diffuse and well shown. Um, there are spindle cells in a fascicular pattern. And examples of spindle cells are these cells shown, uh, cells shown here, a lot of spindle cells shown all over the, the um, histologic sample. Pleomorphic cells with nuclear inclusion are seen, and there's variable hemorrhage with no necrosis shown. Embryonal tumor with multilayered rosette. Well, um, prior to 2016, the World Health Organization actually um, listed these kinds of tumors as the primitive neuroectodermal tumors. But since 2016, the name changed to embryonal tumors. And within the embryonal tumors, we have those with um, multilayered rosette formation and those without multilayered rosette formation. But most of them are also supratentorial tumors. Now, these supratentorial tumors, um, embryonal tumor 
some of the most layered uh, we said, have a solid and a cystic component. The solid components usually can grow to quite large sizes and the cystic components are shown also. Now this tumor shows um, an, a, an extension of the tumor even outside the skull too. This is an exal T2 showing the tumor, the solid component, the areas of peritumoral edema, and the cystic components are also shown by the side. On exhale flare, it's almost all, also the same thing as shown in the T2, but with um, more um, uh, inversion, fluid inversion here. The features shown on T1 are that it's highly variable and can be hypo to iso intense, so the T1 may not be all specific. But on T2, there's a high signal solid component with cystic components being common. Contrast enhancement shows heterogeneous enhancement. Why the diffusion weighted imaging shows restricted diffusion. On histology, there's a biphasic architecture. Biphasic in the sense that um, the entire tumor doesn't have the same homogeneous um, architecture. And there are clusters of small cells with scanty um, nuclei and with scanty cytoplasm and um, round nuclei. These small cells are usually the ones that form the um, large the uh, rosettes. So the, the small cells often occur in clusters and they are multiple forming the rosettes. There are mitotic and apoptotic bodies in large cellular, cellular areas with multilayered rosettes, as I already mentioned. These embryoplastic neuroepithelial tumors are often bubbly and sometimes do not even become bigger than the size that they present with over time. So uh, sometimes they're also benign. And um, these tumors on T2 are hyperintense, showing a homogeneous signal, hyperintense. There, there's some impinging on the um, surrounding brain tissue as shown. Uh, no areas of peritoneal edema are seen, is seen. And also there is no, um, on the exact flare, there is uh, mixed, signal cellular, mixed signal intensity with what we call a bright wing sign. So it appears like there is an area of hypointensity and a surrounding area of hyperintensity, a circular hyperintensity, which is known as the bright wing sign on flare. So um, these are the MRI findings, features of the December plastic neuroepithelial tumors on exile flare. On histology, you find that the cells of the um, the cells of the DNET are uh, uniform oligodendroglioma-like cells. And these multiple small purple-like um, cells are usually the oligodendroglioma-like cells. And they are in a rich Muslim background with specific glioneurola evidence, scattered astrocytes, which are not seen clearly here and where mitotic figures are shown. Um, metastasis, usually for metastasis, you find metastasis, multiple metastasis within the the uh, brain matter. And that is one of the diagnostic features of metastasis. Uh, but most of these metastases usually have a, they're usually hypointense, with their center having a part being hype, they are hyperintense with their center having a part of hypointensity and surrounding peritumoral edema. That's almost always common to all um, metastases to the brain. And this feature is known as the bull eye sign the bull eye sign. Here is the um, image of a small cell lung cancer metastasis to the brain. And like I said, there are usually more than one or multiple as shown in this image. Uh, moving on to the management of most of these supratensorial tumors, the, it's based on having a clear history from the patient, a good examination with good examination findings, and investigation results, which will support the diagnosis that um, the clinician is having in mind. With all this, then you can now decide on which of the modalities, management modalities that can be employed. And most times these modalities are usually surgical uh, via a craniotomy or craniectomy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy, and rehabilitation. And oftentimes in the management of patients with this condition, the, um, there's a combination of most of these um, modalities. So here's a table showing the, the management options for the discussed uh, tumor types and the prognosis of these tumors. Uh, for diffuse astrocytomas, for most of them, um, surgical resection is the go-to uh, 
management option or intervention. But also for most of them, there is a combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. As shown for um, diffuse astrocytomas, radiotherapy is really the go-to adjuvant um, therapy or intervention after you surgically resect the tumor, all or part of it. And the prognosis and survival period for these tumors, patients with these tumors after intervention is about nine years, uh, which is quite fair. For the glioblastoma, the STOP protocol is employed, and the STOP protocol was discovered in 2006, and it has two components, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, with the radiotherapy going on for about six weeks, and, and a total of 60 gray is um, administered. It's two gray daily dose for most of the um, period of the six weeks. While for the chemotherapy, it's done with temozolomide, and the temozolomide is administered both during the radiotherapy and post radiotherapy. With the temozolomide, a 75 milligrams is given per meter square of body surface area daily for the six weeks of radiotherapy. Why post radiotherapy? 150 to 200 milligrams of temozolomide is given for five days within a 28 day cycle. And the total period, total number of cycles for chemotherapy is six weeks, six cycles. Now, um, with the stop, protocol, the two-year survival is shown to be about 26.5% in most of these patients, which is um, higher than in patients just managed with radiotherapy. For pleomorphic xanthoastrocytomas, the surgical resection modality is the most um, preferred management option. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy have not been shown to be um, to confer much therapeutic advantage. The five-year survival is about 90%. While the five-year disease-free period is 70%. However, there is a high chance of malignant uh, transformation and local recurrence. For the embryonic tumor with multilayer reset, it has a very poor prognosis of about nine months, even with intervention. And the um, interventions employed are the surgical resection, systemic chemotherapy, or craniospinal radiation. These embryoplastic neurophilia tumors are benign, like I, like I mentioned earlier. And surgical resection is the most preferred um, management option and it has an excellent prognosis. When metastases usually have a poor, very poor prognosis. And this may be explained by the fact that usually for there to be metastasis to the brain, the primary tumor is already at stage four. And stage four tumors usually have a very poor prognosis, even with the best of management. So um, management option in this case is usually aimed at palliation and um, they could include surgical resection, chemotherapy, being radiation, or corticosteroid or hyperosmolar agents. The corticosteroids and hyperosmolar agents usually help with the, um, with the peritoneal edema and help to reduce the intracranial pressure, especially that, that which builds up from the edema. Again, with most of these tumors, some of these tumors predispose individuals to having seizures. So anti-seizure medications can also be administered in these cases. Then after the surgical resection and um, chemo or radiotherapy, then you could also look at physiotherapy because with the resection of parts of the tumor or a significant amount of normal brain tissue, there could be some neurological deficit, which is also a complication of these of this interventions for these patients. Um, other complications would include bleeding and infection. Bleeding because most of these tumors are highly angiogenic. They have a high vascular proliferation and resecting such tumors would lead to a considerable amount of bleeding. And um, measures must be taken to avoid such um, complications. Acute toxicity would uh, result from radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And some of these would include alopecia or dermatitis. There could also be diarrhea and some other skin changes as, as may occur. Radiation necrosis is another complication. Why neurocognitive changes are also a form of um, complications. This complicate, the neurocognitive changes may be as a result of the tumor, may also be as a result of the tumor excision or any um, intervention done or due to the radiation and chemotherapy given. Uh, but with good surgical intervention and um, good clinical acumen, Clinching the diagnosis is made easier, and also these complications are reduced to the BRS minimum. Um, these are the references I used for the presentation. Thank you so much.
So we'll be looking at um, contributions and questions now. Well, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, really grateful and it was uh, uh, so detailed and on point. Uh, thanks again, thanks a lot. Uh, at this time, I think we're going to invite questions if there's anyone with a question or maybe any contribution, anything that you want to uh, contribute or a question that you'd want to ask, uh, please feel free. Uh, so there's a question in the chat box from uh, Dr. Gilbert. He says, would you recommend uh, keyhole uh, craniotomy in uh, supratentorial uh, tumor surgery or vertical incision uh, during surg uh, surgical resection? So um, while in my preparation for this discussion, uh, keyhole craniectomy was actually one of the modalities for some of the tumors, um, especially the smaller and easily accessible tumors, supratentorial tumors, uh, presented in this in this discussion. However, again, I must I must say that um, uh, these are I have not seen a keyhole craniectomy done even in my exposure in UCH, uh, that is University College Hospital Ibadan, but. Uh, I think in more advanced climbs, it's also it's a modality of management for some of these tumors. I am sure some of our colleagues, uh, senior colleagues who are in the in the field, can help offer a better answer to that question. Um, but yes, I think keyocrinectomy can also be used, as I have seen in my research for this for these tumors. Okay, uh, so Dr. Chibuikum says uh, thank you for your presentation. Quite amazing. In your second on your uh, in your second slide, you mentioned that uh, supratentorial tumors are the second common cause of uh, cancers in uh, children. Then um, then went on to mention that uh, forty percent are supratentorial. Uh, are supratentorial. Uh, did you mean the uh, that brain cancer is the second commonest? Then he says, um, yeah, maybe maybe if you can first answer that question. Maybe Dr. Chibuke, it's okay. You can you can probably. Uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. If I tell you in a position to do that. Oh, hi. Um, my network is not so good, so I'm not sure how much um, you would be able to hear me. But yeah, um, great presentation, um, Dr. Toba. Yeah, so um, what I was basically asking was in, in your, in, when we were talking about the incidents, you, you mentioned that, um, or oh, doing your slide, just with the second commonest um, cause of cancers in children. So, what well, you mentioned, supratentorials are the second commonest cause of cancers in children. Um, I was asking if you're referring to supratentorials or brain tumor because, like, or brain cancers, because I know that infratentorial cancers, like you rightly put 60%, are more common than supratentorial. So, did you mean brain cancers are the second commonest cause in children? Um, that's the yes, question. yeah, okay, yeah. yes, yes, that must have yeah. been a slip on my part, yeah. So, yeah, all right. Um, and then the second one was and when we we're giving the different genes that cause cancer, if you could quickly go to that slide, yeah. So, for Tourette syndrome, you put TSC1 and TSC2. Um, what I know TSC to mean is the tuberous sclerosis gene, right, on chromosomes mm -hmm. 9 and 16. And not with Tourette syndrome. Tourette syndrome is usually the one S L I T R K one gene. So maybe you can just clarify that or check on that. But yeah, that's okay. about the wonderful presentation once again. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Chief. I'll check. I'll check on the the clarifications. Okay. Um... Is there any, any other question or any uh, addition maybe to the questions that have been asked? If you have uh, any explanation or you want to add anything? Okay. Um, so uh, Dr. Ben Miner, I think uh, probably this is uh, a, an answer to the question that was uh, asked earlier by uh, Dr. Gilbert. Um, says the choice of incision is dependent on the location of the tumor and uh, the challenges expected are uh, based on imaging, uh, such as uh, vascularity. So keyhole uh, craniotomies uh, can be done uh, for tumors um, 
uh, for tumors uh, such as a small olfactory uh, groove uh, meningiomas. Uh, you can also do a vertical incision uh, such as a uh, mini uh, uh, terreno uh, for medial uh, sinoid uh, wing meningiomas. And then um, Alice also mentioned that, uh, um, uh, you mentioned that in children uh, population, supertentorial tumors are second common. And, uh, but recently the, uh, the lecture said uh, that it is uh, neuroblastoma. Uh, uh, can you explain that uh, uh, in, in more details? So I think uh, it's a comparison between uh, the uh, supratentorial tumors and the neuroblastoma in terms of which one is uh, the second commonest. Um, well, from the um, little research I did while preparing for this, for this, uh, presentation. The, well, as Dr. Um, Anthony had mentioned and has corrected, brain tumors are actually the second commonest form of cancers, but um, in the pediat pediatric population, infratentorial tumors are higher, that's about 60%, and supratentorial are about 40%. Some studies say 50-50 on both, on both sides, but what I also know is that infratentorial tumors are higher on both sides. Now, neuroblastomas, I'm not specifically sure about neuroblastomas being the second commonest form of cancers. If you are talking about specifics of the tumor types, then you may be aware that neuroblastomas are the second commonest. But still, neuroblastomas are also a form of um, um, brain cancer. So it's still fall as second commonest form of cancers in children. I don't know if that explains it. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Toba, uh, for the presentation. I. I uh, really guess there are no any other questions or any additions. So this was really a great presentation and we are so grateful. And uh, uh, we really hope that uh, you're going to be available again next time uh, for another presentation. Uh, so I want to also uh, encourage everyone else uh, to always be available in case you would want to present. You can always, uh, you can always, uh, uh, um, uh, let me know or any of the leaders, uh, but uh, you can obviously let me know and then we can always uh, uh, schedule uh, for a presentation whenever there's, uh, there's first place. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Toba and uh, everyone else that attended this presentation. Uh, we're so grateful. So I think we're going to end the presentation here. Uh, have a wonderful uh, evening, everyone.